It's um, well recognized that Americans have um, trouble meeting their minimum required uh, or recommended activity levels. And so having bike paths and sidewalks that you feel comfortable using helps you kind of kill two birds in one stone. If you're going to do an errand and you can be active doing that, it helps you um, to meet those levels. So we might kind of feel when we are in a walkable community, how it's more comfortable than when we're in an unwalkable community. There are elements that, um, that we can actually pick out and describe when we're there. And these, um, these span from land use to access, safety, security, and aesthetics. And I'll go into these a little bit more. But in this image that you see, it is a historic neighborhood in Washington, D.C. area. It doesn't look very inviting, at least. I, I feel that it wouldn't be that fun to walk around that street. It actually kind of resembles some of the um, parts of New Braunfels up near I-35. So if you can envision this as an example, we'll, um, we'll show you how, the, how you can change some of these walkability elements and come up with a better neighborhood. So there's several challenges facing the street. There are um, so many vacant and empty lots that there's really not a reason to be there. The sidewalks are available, and there is some signage to help uh, point out where pedestrians would cross, but the empty streets really invite cars to just speed through the area. There isn't any shade for people that are walking, and the lights that are there are really tall street lamps, so they're producing light for the street more than for the sidewalk where you'd be walking. This is the same street with a little bit of um, walkability elements phased in. You can see that a few of the vacant areas and um, empty lots have been filled in with some buildings, so it improves the land use. A crosswalk has been added to help increase the safety of the pedestrians using it. There's lighting to fit the scale now of people on the sidewalk. The trees make it more aesthetically pleasing and comfortable to walk along that street. All right. Thank you, Neil. And finally, with a few more elements of walkability um, phased in, we have more buildings. We have on-street parking. And these both kind of serve to narrow the street and give it a defined edge, which makes it a lot more inviting to, to just walk and linger within. There's a lot of pedestrian activity now. And the lights make it feel safe, even though this is a picture depicting it at night. So this has really changed the character of, of the previous, the first slide showing this area. So we'll go a little bit more into the, land, um, the walkability factors. The first is land use. And if you're not familiar with that term, it's a little bit of an odd term, it just describes what kind of purpose a piece of land is put to. So is it put toward a residential purpose where you would live or a retail business where you would go shopping? When land uses are mixed, such as in the right side of the slide here, you can walk more easily to the school, to the mall, to your home. But on the more left side of the slide, it shows that there's uh, more separate uses of the land. So walking from your home here would take a lot more distance to get to the school. Uh, it becomes almost impossible to make that trip on foot or by your bike. A side note, if you've heard of the term mixed use, um, this means that mixes are literally mixed on top or within each other, so that you might be able to live on the second story of a building, whereas the first story is used as a, like retail and shopping. So that might be a term that comes up in conversations later. Access is a second type of a walkability element. Um, it really influences the degree uh, to which you would be encouraged or discouraged from using a certain transportation choice. Cul-de-sacs, like this one, uh, make it really indirect to reach your destination. So even though these neighbors are back to back, they have to walk around the entire circle to, to say hey to each other. Um, it's not very natural to want to walk in an environment like this. And what we want is an environment that it does feel natural to be able to just step outside and walk a short trip. 
Um, next slide. This is a picture from Google Earth. And you might recognize it as the neighborhood that we're in now. This shows a really fine-grained grid network. And it is an exceptional, um, it, it shows the potential that this neighborhood has for being a lot more walkable because of the number of intersections that you can reach by just walking down one street. This helps you um, walk and bike more directly. It also helps filter traffic um, around different routes so that there aren't as many cars along some of the major streets and they have more options to, uh, to, to move, move, move around the neighborhood. Safety is a highly important factor of walkability. Uh, driving speed can contribute to how safe it feels to walk and bike next to the road. Crashes that occur at about 20 miles per hour are much less severe than those that occur at a higher speed. In fact, they are about 95% um, likely to be all right if you're hit by, um, by a car moving at about 20 miles per hour, which is a school speed limit. And uh, a car hitting a pedestrian or a bicyclist at 40 miles per hour has, uh, it's a four out of five percent, or four out of five uh, chance that that pedestrian would then be fatally struck. So that difference in speed really influences um, the, the impact on that life. Vehicle speeds, um, the, wi the wider a road or a travel lane is actually, can influence to the driver how fast it seems, uh, he seems able to, to move the car. And the faster the cars are traveling, the less safe it feels to walk next to them. So designing narrower streets and, and lanes, adding pedestrian crossing signals, adding pedestrian medians, medians sorry, so that you can cross a lane of traffic and wait until it's safe to cross the next lane of traffic. Um, are ways to enhance the safety. This is an example of a miniature roundabout, which allows cars to yield for each other instead of coming to a four-way stop, but greatly reduces the speed at which they're interacting in that um, intersection, and therefore reduces the impact if a crash occurs. And then safety improvements can also be, they can be built or they can be programs. This really fun picture on the left is an example of a walking school bus. And um, this is a program that ACOG helps schools um, develop. Um, and it essentially relies on parent volunteers to pick up kids on the way, on the route to school, so that by the end they have a number of kids essentially as a school bus but walking. And then security is another important aspect of, um, of walkability. We can call it eyes on the street. Um, these two photos show quite a difference in how secure you would feel walking by the, the two buildings. This one is, has no transparency. There's no windows for anybody inside to be looking out and, and watching the road. Whereas this, this photo shows lots of windows. So not only is it safer for people walking by um, they have people looking after them. It's more interesting. You can look in and see what people are doing in there. And then finally, aesthetics and, uh, or comfort is another way of looking at it. Can greatly enhance just how enjoyable it might be to, uh, to walk. Um, this shows a very comfortable and pleasing environment, enhanced by trees, sidewalk, uh, tables, and um, just a pleasant environment in general. So I'm going to show another example of, um, of how you might change a part of the neighborhood that, that feels like it could be improved. This is um, lacking people, lacking an activity, lacking security. There's really no reason that you would be walking here unless you absolutely needed to be. With some phase improvements, such as adding crosswalks, cleaning this up to be more like a park, adding trees. We have a much, much nicer kind of residential area to, to be in, but it feels safer and calmer than the previous photos. This is um, kind of similar to that photo that we just looked at being developed. 
And it's an example from around here. Does anybody know, do they recognize where this intersection is? Exactly, all right, you can give it away. There we go. So um, last weekend, Patrice and Ari and I had the opportunity to go out with a few um, children who are residents in the neighborhood and go to the schools here. We were accompanied by Officer Mike and his officer friend who is not here. Um, and I'd like to invite you guys to come up. Okay, so we have with us JV on, who is in fifth grade, and Latrell, who is in sixth grade, Diana, who is now in ninth grade. She has, um, she's reached high school. Always really cool. Um, so these are, um, this shows the beginning of the walking audit, and y'all can, if you want to see, y'all can go over there. Um, that we took on Saturday. Um, we essentially started off at the Wheatley Heights Community Center. And um, next slide. Took notes about what we saw. So here we see that some bus stops had shelters, like the one on the top left, or a bench, but maybe it just had a waste basket. And this is what it felt like for us when we were walking along New Braunfels Avenue, the more commercial strip. You can see how um, solid the walls were. There were no windows for people to be looking out of or for us to look into. The traffic was very close to the sidewalk. And um, I should have mentioned, I'm sorry, these photos were all taken by these three young um, adults here. So they had a great eye and really, uh, have contributed a lot to uh, the visuals in this presentation right now. All right, these uh, show trash, some abandoned properties, uh, a stray dog, and people that don't have a permanent home here yet in the neighborhood, and then some sidewalk impediments. Um, here we can see, I think Latrell was taking photos behind his little brother, Javion, and uh, at the top right is where we were trying to, we we're approaching Wheatley Middle School on um, Lu, Louisa. Um, and we just ran into this lot that was overgrown with trees. So right before approaching this school, you just can't keep going on that sidewalk. But there were also some cool things that, that everybody um, got to see. There were some yards that were really well kept up. There was uh, some, cool, some cool art that kind of helps people when they're walking um, get a sense of place. And then there was a block um, party and rummage sale that really was bringing out a lot of community members at a local community center. And afterward, we all sat down in the Wheatley commu um, Heights community room and talked about what we saw. So I'm going to ask y'all a few questions. And I'll hand the mic over to you. We'll start with you, Latrell. What was it that you liked about the walk? Uh, I like taking pictures. And, uh, and talking about the different lands and everything. Just like, I like the walk because I just like to take pictures, be safe on the on the sidewalk instead of the street, because because instead of like you you're not on the sidewalk, you might get run over by a car, and you have to just be safe to stay on the sidewalk and look back way to see any cars that are coming, and um. <laughs> That's all I know. But last year, this is um Wheatley Middle School. I was like eighth grade. I saw one. Of, I saw one. Of, one of the men. I saw one man almost got run over by a cop because he was on the sidewalk. But he used to be on the on the street because um he he had a little both ways all of that. He almost. But he he just got lucky. He didn't get run over that time. He just like okay. <laughs> he just okay. Not not gonna happen. 
So we just want the we just want all the people to be saved, be saved on the sidewalk, to stay going on the streets. Okay, I just want to interject here uh, because they're acting all shy now. But on Saturday, we were asking, okay, so are you guys going to be ready to participate? There are going to be a lot of folks, and are you ready? We want you to come up, and we want you to talk. And uh, what did you tell me, Latrell? Latrell said, oh, yeah, I got it. I, you know, I, I performed. I've been on stage before, so I had... <laughs> I had this, now they're acting all shy. But they just need to know that you, the audience, you know, you're here for them and you support them and just need them to be, just tell us, talk to us and uh, <laughs> let us know what you think because they gave us some really profound information. They said things, you know, out of the mouths of babes. They said some things on Saturday that had Allie and I clutching the pearls because we were like, you know, so uh, taken aback by what these children were saying. So I want you guys to stand up. And then I want you to see how I talk and see how Miss Ari holds the mic. How she talking to the mic? See how I talk in the mic? Okay, I want you to talk in the mic and talk up so we can hear you. And when Allie asks the questions, answer and talk to us like you did, uh, talk to this audience like you did on Saturday. Uh, the difficult parts about the walk was like all the trees and everything. They were like when we were walking, they were on the sidewalk, and we had to go on the street. And the sidewalks were too small. Yeah. The difficult part of the walk was having to um, go on the street because the trees and all the grass and bushes were blocking us from from walking on the sidewalk. Looking at the houses, I was picturing it like all my game that I play Minecraft, where you get to build all these kind of different houses. And um, like I was saying that on Minecraft, like you get to build all these different kinds of houses. And I was like, oh, we could take all the abandoned houses and build something with them, like take the land and build something or some more different houses. And. Um, And like, when we were walking, I was looking at the houses and I was picturing the game that I play at my house, like, like it was real life. Uh, yeah, it was hard to picture all the houses and everything. A little bit, it was a little difficult. All the houses were boarded up or abandoned, and all the grass was messed up, the gates were messed up, and everything like that. Yeah. <laughs> Change about 
this we build we build a new house instead of old house because because then because the old house the people lives in it doesn't it doesn't look right for them it just need them it just need a new house to build everything for everyone so they can find a house what they want but make trees all of that just maybe one or two trees pretty pretty good grass with flowers have their own path have a family get a new restaurant go to the store. One thing I would like to change is the houses. Even if they weren't boarding up, some of them look old and kind of messed up a little bit. Some of the things that I would like to change is some of the abandoned houses. You can take them and make them into game arcades for some of the kids out here because a lot of them don't have what they really want in the, in the neighborhood. You have to travel to get to those places for your kids. And I, I thought that we could make it closer so we won't have to go far. That was excellent. I was really happy to have a chance to walk with y'all um, on Saturday and get a better perspective um, of the neighborhood and see what could be talked about tonight and ideas for changing it. So y'all can sit down if you want to now. Um, thank you guys again. All right. Um, and with that, it's a great transition. Uh, so we won't be doing a walk um, ourselves, but we do have some really great maps of this area. And we will roll them out onto tables. And we'd like uh, you guys to participate by breaking up into a few, diff a few groups. Um, do we know about how many people we have here? Probably groups of... Um, Maybe groups of five or so that give us um, five different groups. So um, we'll do that in just a second. We'll roll out those maps. We also have one really long map that specifically looks at Givers Street, which is designated as an education corridor because it connects both Wheatley Middle School here um, with Washington Elementary a few blocks down. And um, this is a special interest to the Choice and Promise projects. Uh, they'd like to um, really understand what kind of obstacles the children and the parents of those children that attend those schools run into. So if you could raise your hand if you attend one of those schools or if you're a parent of one, of a child who goes to those schools. And it would be excellent if y'all could participate on, um, with that map. And. Um, I just read the slide. Did you guys read it? <laughs> um, <laughs> well, that would have been the Gieber Street map, but we'll have it in actuality for y'all to write on. Um, okay, so let's take a break and get situated for this more interactive um, mapping session. And we'll come back in about half an hour and um, report back have y'all report back about the types of problems that y'all see and the solutions that you uh, have ideas for solving.
And um, we have five groups to give comments. So I'd like to start with the group closest to the front right here. And uh, who can I ask to kind of share with us what, um, what you marked on your map, what you noticed um, or wanted to share with the rest of the group? All right, for, so for our table in the front here, we identified some problems being um, trash and brush. Those were two major things that we identified. Um, trash being on the North Walters Street, and then also along, let's see, that one's not labeled. All right, and then lighting in general was pretty poor that we couldn't really identify any spot in particular because it was everything was identified as poor lighting um, vacant housing was a big problem as well um, there was also stray dogs um, seems to be a problem in this area with people dumping dogs off um, train noise as well um, I guess the train horn from 11 to about 6 in the morning goes off and that is kind of a nuisance and then rental versus absentee ownership is a problem there's more uh, rentals in this area but the ownership that there is there's a lot of absentee ownership so those were main the main things and then we identified in the middle um, areas of crime and then areas of speeding as well and then on the left side in the red um, there was some infrastructure with um, possibly plumbing. There was like a, an odor that was being emitted. So we identified that as well. And a possible park too, that there's a lot of people that would like a park there, so. Did y'all have a specific location about the plumbing and the odor and? Okay, very good. Can I ask you to introduce yourself? My name is Ruby Sheffield. I live at 1419 Onslow. My name is Mary Emerson. I live at 1351 Onslow, and I am president of Power Place East Lawn Neighborhood Association, also on the advisory committee for Promise Neighborhood. Minnie Applewhite, 618 Larry Street. Beverly Watts Davis. That was great with a lot of specific locations, so we appreciate that. Okay. And can you introduce yourself right before you start talking? Yes. All right. I'm Alberta Harris. I'm a resident of the East Side, and I work for the East Side Promise Neighborhood. Uh, we redid our whole map, and um, somebody told me two minutes, and so I'm going to go through it real quick. Uh, we have several elementary schools in this area, and I was explaining to them, the people that live on the right-hand side of Walter Street, kids go to have to go to China to catch the bus to go way up here to Persian. So it was dangerous for the kids. And we had shown in certain areas on Hayes and Rio Grande to Walters, it's no sidewalk and we have kids walking down there. We talked about Walter Street. As people come off 35 and come on Walters, they pick up speed. They doing like 40 to 50 miles all the way down to St. Phillips. And that's a danger hazard for our kids because the Walter Street Bridge do have sidewalk, 
but no protection for the people who are walking on the sidewalk. And then we talked about the drainage area, how the drainage area uh, surrounds over here by Wheatley Middle School. It's an area up under the uh, Walters Bridge called the Goonies, where our kids skip school at. But it's down in the drainage ditch, where our drainage need to be safer, because as you walk in and it's a uh, hard rain, it's like the Rio Grande River. And all I had to do was just push you in there, and you're gone. And our drainage runs all the way to behind the AT&T. And then we talked about, hmm, can we clean up in the Brownfield Street? And then over here on Hudson, Hudson is at the end of the football field, where uh, in certain areas of Hudson Street is no sidewalk. And the kids are walking in the street because their parents tell them, don't walk on the side the courts are. So they are in the streets about to get hit because there's no sidewalk. Uh, did I miss anything else? Okay, thank you. <laughs> oh, and cl okay, and these are my 10 members. And we talked about HEBs. HEBs need to be cleaned up a little. Okay, and these are my team members. Chuck Landy. Eric Akins. Minnie Collins. And this is our team. Thank you very much, Alberta and the team. Um, I'm going to come over next to um, Miss Darcy Shapool and Frederick, um, who will speak a little bit about um, what maps they were working with. So our group kind of dwindled. They had places to be. Um, so Fred and I, we kind of tried to gather what um, I think it was Melanie and Martha had to say about their area. They looked at, we were looking at Giever Street, and they really, to them, felt like Giever Street wasn't really where the issue lies. Um, they felt that there were some other corridors. Lamar Street was one of them that they recommended. And one of their concerns was um, the vacant houses and the visual, the lack or visual appeal um, of those vacant houses and how they're boarded up. And so one of Fred's recommendations was that maybe code compliance could have some stricter regulations on how those houses are boarded up and uh, maintained when they are vacant. So um, that was kind of part of what we discussed. And then also um, code compliance said as a reminder that you can call 311 and identify those homes to code compliance so that they can go by, take a look at them, and try and see what, what the rules and regulations allow them to require of those abandoned properties. Fred, did you want to add anything? So that was pretty much what we got. I know I saw that y'all were having a lengthy conversation with Code Compliance, so it was really great that they were there and able to take part in that. Um, thanks. Um, Clay and the group over here, who would like to uh, summarize the conversation that, that y'all had? Okay. So, um, we, um, we marked up a lot of areas on our map. Uh, we got a lot of really good discussion. Uh, some of our, our top concerns were uh, traffic calming around the schools uh, because there's a lot of speeding. And we kind of suggest a lot of ideas about um, speed bumps and flashing overhead lights um, at some of the, um, these roads along here where um, near, the ones kind of near the school, um, there's a lot of areas that are too dark and there's a lot of speeding, so just a lot of different ideas. Um, we even circled little areas like where there'd be a, um, like a roundabout would be a really nice solution to um, prevent cars, because sometimes the streets don't go straight through. You have to make a sharp turn and then an, another quick turn. And so it, it creates a lot of conflict for the pedestrians cross, crossing the street. So um, we also identified um, areas where there can be a lot of sidewalk improvements. Um, for, um, I guess, wheelchair access, and uh, along, especially along the main roads like Walters and New Braunfels. 
um, and then some gaps as well near the schools um, shown on the map. Um, it, you know, around the elementary schools, there are some areas where there's um, no sidewalks, and it would just be, you know, the, the nice thing to have those sidewalks, you know, filled in so that the kids have a nice area to walk. Um, and um, also, yeah, the power lines in the, in the sidewalks as well are obstacles for wheelchairs, so, but um, that's kind of a summary of, um, of some of the things that we talked about. And then, yeah, like I said, kind of in this, it, the most uh, western part of the neighborhood, there's, um, you know, a lot of missing sidewalks, and then it's very dark for, or like, around um, Bowden Elementary and the speeding. So um, crossing guards also would really help to, um, I guess, get the kids from, you know, the different sides of the street. And um, that's, a, that's about it. Yeah. Oh, and, yeah, and then the boarded up houses as well. Um, I know it's kind of um, an issue with some in, in this part of the neighborhood is kind of the one we singled out in particular. Thank you very much. Um, <laughs> that was a, that was really great, and especially for that part of the, the neighborhood. Is that where y'all reside? So. Thank you for being the eyes um, there for that. That's yes. My name is yeah. Tiffany Thompson, and I live on the western part of the of New Braunfels, close to Olive Park, and I live up close to Olive Park and Ella Austin and Bowden. Right along this area, right down here, along Lamar Hayes and all that, the streets are really bad. And if you notice. There is no sidewalk around Bowden at all. The cars park on the grass on the outside. There's one way in and there's one way out. And if you go down Burleson, which is the front of the school, there's only one way to get down there. And then on the other side, there are a lot of abandoned houses, no sidewalks, anything. To be totally honest, if you look across the street, you would be kind of embarrassed that your child goes to the elementary school right there. And if Ella Austin is a part of the East Side Promise. You wouldn't want somebody to travel all the way down Lamar on a bumpy road. It is horrible to get to an organization that we have in our community. We don't have a lot down there due to the fact of the traffic and no sidewalks. So our group is focusing mainly on the safety of the children because we have no sidewalks for them to walk on. So as parents, we're not going to let them out. We're not going to let them walk along the streets in the grass. Thank you, guys. <laughs> Thanks, Tiffany, for, for adding that and for letting your kids participate on Saturday, too. <laughs> yes. Would you be able to say who, who y'all are? <laughs> I think that I'm getting a cold shoulder. <laughs> Oh, my name is Shonda Thomas. Gladys. 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 Glad. <laughs> Gloria Rainey. Lisa Bailey. Thank you. <laughs> um, and our last group for the evening to report back to us. Yes, since y'all are at one side, everybody, if y'all can shift this direction. Good afternoon. Good, good evening. Uh, first, we'll introduce our team. Hudit Vega. Oscar Banner. Joaquin Arch. Oh, turn the other way. Sideways. All right. Back up. Back up some. So, so we've color coded our map. Um, so we started with, with the red. So what we said about the red, we've identified areas where there's drug, drug trafficking going on, where gangs hang out, and the X's identify where the corner stores are. So we said that something needs to be done about those. So if we're going to talk about security, let's start focusing on those areas first. The green is we identified as, what, as green. Sidewalks? As, 
is to widen the sidewalks because there's not enough room for anyone to walk up and down. On a lot of areas up and down New Braunfels, you have some driveway, so there aren't, there aren't sidewalks at all. And she suggested that, you know, families with a stroller and a child, they all can't fit at one time, so they're like trailing behind. The red, all the way up and down, the, up and down New Braunfels, there, there are several areas where stoplights need to be put in or a roundabout. The area that we focused on for a roundabout to be put was at the corner of New Braunfels and Burnett, just because at that intersection, the buildings are historic, so they can't be moved. So when you get to that stop sign, you have to kind of come out almost into the street before you can either go left or right. So once we saw the demonstration about the roundabout, that may be maybe an easier fix than doing some altercations there. Um, also, what we discussed is making New Braunfels a one-way, either using parking on, on that outside lane closest to the sidewalk or, like we said earlier, widening that sidewalk. Because if the kids are walking down and there's parking there, you won't necessarily have to worry about your child trailing you. The other area that we identified is how can we fix and make more beautiful that, that path between the two schools was a protected, a protected bike lane. So that would also you know, alleviate you having to widen the sidewalk, just put a protected bike lane on either side of the street. And using some type of buffers, so putting new trees in to make it look uniform all the way down and also maybe coming up with some type of plan if it's agreed upon by the residents that live there, a uniform fence line that takes you from the whole street all the way to the school. The blue dots that you see here are bike lanes that would connect Wheatley to St. Phillips. Even though it wasn't in the, in the footprint, but you know we want to create that from elementary to middle and middle all the way to college. We also discussed um, the buffer you see around um, the train track. So a lot of the people that live here have to face the train track. So putting a, a tree system in along that, that street would alleviate some sound and also a view. We, um, the pink you see are the two bridges that represent at Walters and New Braunfels. And doing some type of beautification of the bridge and where the Martin Luther King vision is, being able to change that out maybe quarterly to go along with the themes of whatever's going on in the city, like Fiesta, Martin Luther King, Cinco de Mayo, whatever else is coming up at that time. And then eliminating maybe the concrete barrier and making that some type of decorative design or some type of color, or just pressure wash it for right now. <laughs> um, on the other bridge, um, we have it in colors because you can make these two different colors and have different themes going on. So people can identify if you're at the red bridge or the blue bridge, things like that. So necessarily, you know, you have people that may not speak English. You know, they, these bridges are color coded. So to go along with that. Um, the yellow you see going along the creek line, we said this could maybe be a biking trail that goes along the creek that connects maybe some type of way into the back of the AT&T Center. And then also coming back down here and connecting to the Hay Street Bridge so that it's all the way inviting from downtown to here. And then we also talked about, you know, definitely the need for sidewalks where there's no sidewalks. And other than that, that, that pretty much covered it. Oh, there was one thing that we talked about on that walking trail was maybe putting some lion paws along that trail just because of the school and what it represents. So going one way or the other on the same side as you have the, the bike, the protected bike lane. And that's it. Thank you very much. That was really uh, great. And what was cool is that y'all had some um, possible solutions for some of the identified challenges that some of the other teams had found. Um, I think together there's a lot of insight here that we will be able to, uh, to work with as we move into the next steps. Um, real quick, thank you so much to the facilitators at the tables. Um, 
I think it got off a little bit to a chaotic start, which I apologize for, but everybody seems to have really found their footing in, um, in, in knowing what to, um, to look for on the map and then what to talk about. So thank you to, um, to each of you, Neil and Cecilio and Clay, Darcy, and um, we had a group with, uh, I guess, y'all just kind of did it on yourselves, but Hudit also for, for being from Metro Health. Um, the next steps for the, the workshop are um, uh, to continue commenting on a, an online mapping feature that we have. Um, it's at this website, which is um, sametroplan.org slash choice promise. It's not that easy to remember, but we will, um, but it's on the flyers that were handed out for this event and um, feel free to to ask me if you'd like um, that written down for you. Um, on that is just a, a map, uh, a virtual one that you're able to continue commenting on and, and listing where you'd like to see different improvements. So we'll be taking those through next week. And after that, we'll be incorporating everything that everybody's been saying tonight, earlier, and then over the next week in a report that will be going to uh, elected officials in the area as well as the East Side Choice and Promise uh, programs. And they'll be on the website, um, sametroplan.org, so that you can access them as well. That should be out um, within about a month. And I look forward to hopefully crafting something that uh, is worthy of, of all the comments that y'all had spoken of tonight. Um, finally, the MPO is preparing for a series of its own workshops to update its long-range transportation plan. This is called Mobility 2040, and it happens every five years. So two workshops are um, uh, the closest two are listed here on, on the slide, and um, uh, all eight workshops that will be provided are on mobility2040.org. Um, You've probably noticed the cameras around the, the room. This is now cast essay, and they've been recording the entire presentation and workshop that y'all have um, been participating in. So it will be available for you to, um, to watch as a recording as well, and this entire presentation will be available through that in case you were near the back or had heads in front of you and weren't able to, to see um, part, of, part of the presentation. Um, I, I think that is all, and believe it or not, we're, we're out like just right on schedule, maybe even a couple minutes before. So um, if you have questions for myself, for any of the other staff, feel free to come and, and talk to us afterward. Ari, would you like to have a final word? Okay. I just want to uh, tell you all how much we appreciate you've taken the time uh, out of your schedules to be here with us uh, this evening at this workshop and um, you know there's more to come and we need the community engaged we need our, our residents our neighbors um, our partners we need everybody to be a part of this transformation if it's going to be successful so thank you so much for coming out and we just look forward to bigger and better things. Um, Ms. Watts Davis, did you want to have a word? Okay, all right. So thank you so much and uh, we'll let you know. Please um, you know, look at our, our website and uh, just stay in tune because we want to ensure that we're doing a good job of communicating and if you guys have any ideas about that um, please let us know that also Adrian come on up Adrian Lopez is our director of community development initiatives at the San Antonio Housing Authority Okay, National Night Out, October 1st, and this will be on the Wheatley property. Adrian, at the Wheatley property, or? 
Ah, we're looking at closer to one of the streets. So great. So just keep your eyes and ears open and look for the activities. Um, our promised partners, we want to thank, uh, thank you guys for coming out. And Patrice, uh, everybody, we want to thank our children for uh, being involved and our parents who saw to it that their children participated. So thank you all so much. If you filled out a survey that you picked up when you uh, signed in, please um, leave it at the same sign-in table as you leave. Thank you so much for coming out.